head again, Phyllis. What happened to your laptop hinge? The problem is I have a stand-up desk. Right. So right. The laptop is on top of the stand-up desk. I'm doing some... But I have to, like... I'm doing some trigonometry in my head, but I think I've got it. All right, well, however you choose, the, the microphone is yours. Let, let's hear all about it. Okay. So value stream mapping, quite a buzzword. Getting more and more popular um, over the last couple of years. What I would say is um, somebody is, there's some background noise, so if folks can mute, that might help the audio. So it's really gotten very popular as a concept. And it's yet another way of trying to have technology people talk to the business and work with the business directly and interact with them on their needs, their activities. So you see a lot of it in Lean. Um, DevOps is one where I hear it every time there's a conversation about DevOps. There's a conversation about value stream mapping. IT for IT is highly based on it, as well as some other concepts and probably has been used in Six Sigma for more years than any of the other ones. Um, it's generally in, done when you want to do an improvement program. So what you're really trying to look at is every step in a particular workflow and all of the functional processes looking for bottlenecks and, and loss. And the person that was doing a presentation on it recently that I saw also used the words rat's nests, looking for processes that go across multifunctional teams and get lost in the nest and never come out. So what we're looking for is anything that could cause a process to slow down or break down. And that's why Lean uses it a lot because of the uh, concept of flow. DevOps and, and um, is also using it because it helps the flow as you're working in an agile environment. It helps the flow of code from where you're working to the production environment. So that's the background of it. Um, one, quick, one quick one, Phyllis. Yep. Um, so it seems completely suited to this uh, revisioning that is modernization, making something old and rat's nesty better. But, but equally, if you were starting something fresh, you'd start this way as well to make sure you got your flow right from the outset. Yes, and the other piece of the concept is it starts by defining what processes the business does that provide value to the business. So we'll see that later on in the real world example is, it's like, okay, what do you do to drive revenue? And then how do you get there? So it's really tied to what the business needs to accomplish to either drive revenue or drive administrative value internally. And that's the main thrust, thrust of it. So I know you said the word phrase bottleneck, which is part of this, but it, it, you're saying it's got this um, concept of kind of prioritization involved where you're sizing where to go next or which, which bottleneck to remove next based on yeah. business priority. What you're looking for is anything that's causing people to wait or a process to wait or revenue to wait and then what's causing it to wait. Right. Okay. Pretty clear. Right. Yeah, and that's the part that's really tied to the sort of Kaizen type activities that you do with Lean. Okay, next. It's really pretty simple. That's the, the, the funny thing about it is, you know, people have made it into this huge concept. It's like, oh, value stream mapping. We've got to do value stream mapping. But it's really very simple. And that little cartoon is, is a value stream map showing you, you know, Process one takes a day, um, that 30 second gap in between, and then another day. What are the things we could do to speed up those two processes that take a day? And that's really what you're looking for. So I did a simple one that's an IT one because that's one that we all, you know, can resonate with all of us, right? Because we've all been on this. So it's just showing a map, a simple map of a person who requests access. And in this first example, um, we've got approvals coming in uh, online and we're waiting for those approvals while uh, things are in queue. And then they hit the uh, admin queue where they sit and wait until the administrator gets to the next uh, one on the list. And then the account details are sent to the request of the email automatically. 
So I threw some numbers on it. And I used to work supporting a service desk. And uh, there was a group that did the system administration for our users. So it might take the end user 10 minutes to submit that access request. If the approvals are gathered online, someone may not know there's an approval waiting for them. So it might sit for a few days. And on average, we've measured it using metrics. And we find out that it's three days. And the admin has a service level agreement of three days. So that request might sit in queue for up to three days on a first being taken on a first in, first out basis. And then it takes the admin five minutes to create that account. And the automated email goes out you know, within a minute. So essentially, a simple request that takes six days of waiting time and only five minutes to perform. So that's the sort of thing that we're looking at in value stream mapping. How could we improve that? Um, can I just take a comment here, Phyllis? Just, just go back a second. I mean, oh, it's uh, horrible to look at, isn't it? Those all those days that yeah. have, right. There's a, there's a historic flavour to it already. But I've just been doing a bunch of research about open banking and, and and things, right? And some of the challenges that we're being set in our design team, how you get four steps down to two steps and such. But if I look at some online um, like uh, Robinhood.com, Mint.com or Elivest, something like that, right? Create an account, set up your investment goals inside 90 seconds, yep. right? And, and put money in it. And that's a yep. consumer facing proposition, which has something a bit going on like this. But they're removing all the barriers for you to being able to do that and maybe letting you through the gate quickly and potentially doing a few of the background checks after you through the gate, something, right? Get it down to a minute. What, what, if that's in the world, why should we live in a world where approvals take three days? How can it be? And well, don't you need to be inspired by some of those expect customer expectations that just not only has this got to be a bit quicker, it's got to be lightning fast or this is I'll leave the company. You know, I can't cope with this. It's just blowing my mind. Especially since you create no value while you're sitting and waiting for your account. Right. <laughs> so, so, you're using your home email and stuff like that. And for all right. you know, there might be some employees that never got an email account, and that's what they've been doing inside your organization for like a year now. Well, and if you look at this, you know, most of what I do for Linium is cre creating service catalogs, so service portal, service catalogs. And I go into a lot of IT organizations, and it's scary to see that the experience we have at home is better than the experience we have as employees in many corporations, yeah. large corporations. Right. Is this pr this process? I'm, I'm sure you're about to tell us how it could be incrementally better. You but set it needs me up to, so it, well. It, it needs to be disruptively better, doesn't it? It needs to be disruptively better. So how do we get it disruptively better? And I have to say that I have to think how many years ago. Probably about 12 years ago, the organization I worked for automated at least the network login account creation because if you can do that. That's probably 90% of the accounts you're creating is that Active Directory account. And yeah. most technology today has the ability to be automated. Let's be real. You know, we're there. So this is, if you start looking at it, you know, we submit that access request only for secure things where you really need a manager approval and you can't validate that person online. You know, should you really start looking for that approval request? Um, and then do it by email so it hits a, a personal device and I can accept it right away. Yes, that person works for me. They should have access. And then the minute it's approved, create that account. And just, again, the minute it's approved and the account is created, send those details to the requester. And if I throw on the, the times, you know, we're down to, you know, that under five minutes kind of thing, except maybe we have to wait a little longer for the approval. So to your point, Mark, you know, you want to look at where do I really need approval versus where can I match up the request with information about that person and know that they should have that access anyway, or it's not highly secure and we don't care. Well, you know, in behavioral economics, you might flip it and say it's an opt in rather than an opt out. And most of them go through accept a red flag for someone that has to override that or something. You right. Shut really down. Like Shut down their access in 24 hours if they don't need it. You know, move that approval to the end or not have it hold up the account creation. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, if you were to do that, there's going to be some exceptions, right? There might be some technologies that are in use but so old that you can't automate the creation. 
I would challenge that, but there might be. So what happens is if those are the only ones that have to be done by a human, then, of course, the wait time on the human could get significantly reduced. So either you could put humans on more important tasks and they go in every couple of hours and process everything, or you have someone sitting on the queue and you could probably get that four minute, the four hours down to a few minutes. So that's the concept of value stream mapping. Any comments on all that? I'm going to do a real world example in a moment. Well, well, I'll say well, one obvious way is all of the ways you made, you, you just discussed getting the crunching the time down involve people, process, and technology, right? All of those elements. Do you, do you do all three at the same time or you do it all one way with people and then again with process and then again with technology or how do you split it out? You know what, and you said this when we spoke the first time, it's very much like the digital blueprinting that we do. You do the whole thing together. You know, you look at, now, you might not make the solution happen, but you might say, we want to automate that step over there. The how we automate it, you would come back to the business and go over it, you know, the same way you do with requirements. But you really, the way a lot of this is done typically is to get a group of people in a room that are involved in that process. It's very often done with stickies on a wall or on a whiteboard. You know, write down everything you do. Okay, let's add how long it takes. You might have to have some reports run to add, you know, come back after running some reports to add the average processing time. It depends how much information people know, you know, off the top of their heads. But definitely group activity. Any other comments so far? I guess, I guess one, one other quick observation is, um, this is often what company needs to pay an external person to come and tell them what to do because they're incapable of changing their uh, muscle memory of this is how it's always been. Yes. And, you know, they have to overcome that, don't they? And they that's, need. you know, when I do service portal work, that's the, I guess, the frustrating thing is they really just want to facelift what they have today into what they're going live with. And we're dying to get in and do this sort of work but this is usually a much later phase. They don't typically do it out of the gate. So this is why I do a lot of speaking and writing is because in the conferences I go to, if I could start changing the way people think, then they go back to their offices and they're more receptive to that change. So it's kind of the supporting activities. Okay. This is what a real one looks like. So this is a real world example and I come from the automotive industry so I was very interested to hear what you were saying about the uh, self-driving cars and um, I kind of stuck with what I know so you place a parts order you know for automobiles or anything else any other type of machine and what happens from the time that order is placed to the time the business realizes value and the business is going to realize value when the payment comes in for those parts. Now think of a small business or a cash strap business as I go through this. So in this first example, we're basically pulling the orders and stacking the boxes and it can take anywhere from four hours because the order is sitting in queue waiting to be processed, you know, 15 minutes to do it and then, you know, 20 minutes waiting for someone to pull it and pack it and then two hours it sits in a staging area and then when you have all the orders of that particular section placed we go and we walk them onto the truck we load them onto the truck and then on average the last delivery happens you know within about five hours think about as i go through this all the opportunities you see to decrease the four hours the 20 minutes the two hours and the hour and a half loading time and even with technology to decrease the delivery time. So that happens and the customer gets their parts. Then this company, for whatever strange reason, starts their invoicing process as part of their month end business process. So they start processing invoices for all of that month's orders to date on the 20th of the month. And again, we're taking time to manually prepare an invoice 
stuff, print, and mail an invoice. And then we might have a, a process where the business that bought the part has up to 30 days to pay. In that scenario, from the time the part is pulled to the time I get paid, could be as much as 51 days. I'm going to let that sink in a minute. 51 days for me to get paid for something that I had to pay cash to stock and then deliver to them. So think about the value po potential if we can speed up that process. So here's the first line. And, you know, this is where, it, it, you, you know, feel free to jump in. In this one, you know, we're talking about the six hours to stage and the five hours to complete all local delivery times. When we were preparing for the presentation, Mark and I were talking about, well, you know, if you used IoT devices, you probably could get the delivery time down. You probably could key off in, um, the invoicing process once they're delivered. But there's also a lot of things you could do to get the staging down. For one thing, the pull, pick, and stage, and then load could easily be said, let's take it from the, once I get it in the box stage, get it right onto the truck. Be loading that truck as I'm going. If you start thinking about adding some computerization to understand the geography, you might be, be better able to get things on trucks that are all going to the same area so that the truck is driving less of the area and can deliver more quickly. So those are some very simple things you could do. Does anything else jump out at anyone that, that we could do to speed up this process, make it easier? Let's get, we can yeah. go to the next one. No, hang on. This sounds, like our, this, sounds like, this sounds like our interview to get a job at Google. Come on. We must, <laughs> how do we get the fox and the chicken across the river? Um, so I've got two comments. These are both stories I heard last night um, at this dinner, car parts delivery, which seems to be pretty relevant here, right? What, one, um, you're in a big city. You've got 20 garages around the city. Currently, they, the garages phone to some central warehouse to say that the parts that they need, and they wait till the end of the day and they fill up a truck with the parts and he goes around the next morning to deliver them to the 20 garages, right? They said, right, we completely flipped that. Um, we have a truck driving around the city all day long with the most often requested parts on the truck already. And, you know, what takes a day has become an hour or two for 85, 90% of cases because they know what are the most frequently requested parts. They can send those out on a bike or something, the ones that are a bit out of the norm. Or, of course, we've even had thoughts about um, putting a 3D printer on the truck. And you can print them when you get there, right? But that is really shaking out differently than some... That's the disruptive part, right? Not the incremental part. And then, finally, a guy, um, he said, we, we have a truck every day goes from London to Glasgow in Scotland. And the guy who does the sensors on his fleet said... No, you've got three trucks that go every day from London to Glasgow. And the guy that runs the truck fleet said, no, 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 we've only got one. He goes, I've got the data that shows you've got three trucks going on there. And if I've been studying what they've been doing for the last six weeks, all three of those trucks look like they're going about a third full. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny because as you're talking about the trucks, you know, you have three trucks, you have a, a fleet of trucks waiting for the parts order. Add a little bit of coding to that. I've yeah. got a fleet of trucks all over the city with the most common parts. An order comes in and using the same kind of tech disruptive technology that Uber uses, you know, looking at where are the trucks, looking at where is the, the dealership, that need, the garage that needs the parts, which truck should deliver that and deliver the order or the request for that part to the truck that's the closest to that particular location. Yeah. So, you know, this is where we start using more disruptive technologies to make it even faster. And automate that decision-making process yes. out of the hands of the humans. And they're, um, you know, I like to go past there because there's a nice uh, diner over that way or stuff like this, right? Just take That's that out of their hands to make the company more efficient. I mean, in England this week, three or four more kind of high street brands closing stores all over the place in the face of internet competition. 
And in the phone-ins, why have they done that? There's all sorts of reasons, but lots of people saying their delivery distribution system is archaic. You know, you can see the waste all over the place. And, it, you know, if Amazon, if they're fighting Amazon, they better sharpen up the bits about the waste, hadn't they? Or they've got no chance. That's right. And, you know, on, on this same thing, I'm envisioning, as you said, take it automatic so the driver doesn't, you know, stop at his favorite diner on the, you know, pick it because he wants to go to his favorite diner. I'm having a vision of that app that's showing the, the garage and the trucks and where they are that looks like the Uber app, you know, with all the cars near your pickup location. Yeah. But, you know, in this case, that app is pairing the right parts truck up with the garage. So you could really revolutionize this. You could probably get hours or a full day down to minutes, you know, 30 minutes to most common parts. So, you know, that, there's a lot to be done there. But first, the value stream mapping piece of this is lay it all out so you see what's happening today. And then you can start looking for the process improvements you can make, but also, you know, the disruptive technology and how does that totally transform the experience. Now, we have the same thing on the invoicing side of it, which is why are you waiting until the 20th of the month? Because we've always done it that way. And why are you manually processing and stuffing invoice, printing and stuffing invoices with all of the technology that's available today? And Mark, you had the comment, once I know it's delivered, again, you know, using IoT or other sources, somebody signs for something or they thumbprint and the geometrics say, I've delivered it, I've accepted the delivery. The minute that happens in that same application, the invoice could potentially be electronically delivered to the accounting department of the customer. And if you change your net 30, you know, to payable on demand, now you could potentially have money in your hand for that part within a day or two or however long it takes that customer to pay. The, the signature of receipt is a trigger for the invoice to be generated. Right. And that's like the IoT case study of, you know, a very simple one of a smart contract, which could be on a blockchain, which is, you know, I've got insurance and I'm a farmer against rain. If it rains, I get insurance payout. Well, the sensor detects rain, it pays out. You know, it's just a fact. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do here. So now I've gone from 51 days to get paid for a part to a couple of days. And that's the value in the value stream mapping. We mapped out the process, we improved the process, and we've generated value in I'm getting the money almost immediately. You know, another, we did another way to look at this is that there's there seems to be 50 years of industrialization that humans fluffed this out to be 51 days, didn't they, for their own self-interest along the way. And we're going to yeah. squeeze it out from logic and technology. Well, and it's great for the customer, right? Because the customers floated your money for 50 days. Effectively. Yeah. And when you start looking at cash flow, it's a big deal. Right. I think we just described banking, haven't we, and how peer-to-peer -peer instant payments undo all the fun the banks have uh, with your cash flow. <laughs> yeah. You know, when a car dealer gets a car from a manufacturer, they have that car in inventory for free for 30 days. And after that, whether the car is sold or not, they're paying the manufacturer for it, you know, in installment payments like a car loan. So when they sell a car, the faster they can get the contract and the title and the loans processed and in the hands of the customer, the faster that all of that process works, the more money the dealership saves. So I can remember, you know, again, back 12, 15 years ago when I worked for the automotive industry, we did a project to limit, to um, lower the number of days that a contract was in transit. And the amount of money the company saved was phenomenal. You know, we're talking millions, not hundreds, just by cut, shaving a couple of days off those contracts. Hey, uh, I would also add that um, beside um, speeding up some processes, uh, some of these steps also can save uh, resources, like human resources. For example, this print yes. and stuff invoice, it would save uh, human uh, time that can be relocated to, to other projects. Or That's right. You get to work more strategically. And, you know, someone, we were, do, we're doing an HR project, and someone in HR, as we're talking through some of the um, efficiencies they could gain. The comment wasn't necessarily we can eliminate staff. She said, man, if we could do that, 
I could spend more time with my employees. You know, I could spend more quality time mentoring and, and assisting the associates in the organization in far more valuable activities than finding out small bits of information for them. So we change the way business is done. We can be far more people oriented with one another. We cut out the waste of doing manual processes that could be automated. And all of a sudden, what we're doing every day becomes so much more interesting. Imagine being the person sitting there prepping the invoice after invoice after invoice all day long. For 40 years. For 40 years, yeah. We don't have to do it that way anymore. So, you know, that's really what we're, we're trying to do here. It's um, a lot of what I see when we start standing up service catalogs is we're instrumenting their poor processes. The, the whole goal of value stream mapping is to say, hey, let, let's look at this for a second. Let's tear this down into all of its components and look at all of the ways we can use automation and technology to improve the process and all the ways we can take out the human waste along the way. So that's, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, and it, so you do this a lot. I mean, I know you've had a very interesting career, so let's just talk about that for a minute. That You do this a lot in this kind of linear service now scenario, which seems like quite a controlled environment about the levers that you can pull to adjust it. But how about we might end up in some, um, uh, you know, interactions with customers or workshops where it might not be service now, and we could have you doing the value stream mapping leading and some of the guys here you know, solutioning and thinking of ways to choose different combinations of technologies and architectures to solve problems. That might be something, you, you, well, I think I'm saying, you believe this is a way to solve lots of technology yeah. issues, regardless of service now, and the approach, which of course, we have our own approach in my world, this experience design practice. I mean, it's the same, right? It's just a different way to skin the thing, but it's observing what's there, looking at waste, removing it. I mean, it's, you know, le learning and then playing and then trying and prioritizing. There's a, there's a certain logic to it all. But yeah, you're, and I, I would you're have to say a kind of manufacturing um, history, doesn't it? I think that, which is fine, but there's a, there's a history to this, how it got to where it's got to now. Sure. And what I'd say about the blueprinting is I think in many ways, the blueprinting adds another layer on this and you could actually do this and layer the blueprinting process on top of it. You know, the whole, emotions attached to the various parts of the process and some of the work we do on the digital blueprinting side could be layered in with this or combined with it yeah. in, in many ways. And you could certainly start with what's the value stream that we want to map and whether you use this kind of map or a digital blueprint, it's all going to be the same level of effectiveness. Sure. Go, go on, Julian. Can you give us a comment? You know, you, you've been in Nest quite a long time to see how we do certain things inside the centers. Is this a new way of looking at things or a different way of looking at the same thing? Well, one thing's for sure. Um, I've seen uh, I've seen this uh, kind of exercise uh, in the London Center, or even in the last two months with Cloud Factory, for example. So, uh, I I believe we. Uh, we have been doing it for a long time. I'm not sure if we've been calling it this way. Yeah. And it's back to my comment about um, people using an external partner to see this clearly because they can't, they're, they're, they're too blinkered and inside it to see it, where the, the, the waste and the inefficiency is. They need someone else to come and look. And we, and we can only recommend improvement by studying what they have to find the waste, right? And they, they need an honest outsider to be able to do that, I think. Yeah, it's always good when you have somebody keeping uh, drilling down and asking the five whys. Why are you doing right. this? Why, why, why? And, you know, I think the thing that might distinguish value stream mapping and why it's starting to show up in the practices where it's showing up is it's not only the process of doing the map and taking out the waste. It's the fact that it starts with looking at how the business creates value. So where, what are the revenue streams for the business? How do employees in the business create value? And doing this process to those activities. So Next. that's a little bit different focus. Yeah. Okay, Phyllis, I think I'm gonna stop my recording. Thanks ever so much, that was great. Very, I, I love that we're getting some different viewpoints here together. So let me just.